recording started. Howdy. Sunday morning at 8 a.m. Texas time. And today we're in the second class, week one, of course one. And we're looking at the concept of arms length. And this week you'll have an opportunity, if you haven't already, to read through. Um, the arm's length chapter, uh, chapter 40, from the treatise posted in your eCampus. You have several videos, canned video lectures from myself, uh, including one I uploaded just yesterday um, that analyzed the historical cases of arm's length. And then what we're dealing with today, our case study, groups A, B, C, and D, which Bruno de Silva has created dealing with pharma industry. So with no further ado, I'll let Bruno take it. Bruno is driving. <laughs> I'm not Bruno driving, driving the car. Because I don't want to be fined, but uh, yeah. So I just finished lunch with my dad because I'm in Portugal. So I'm actually very near to the sea, just to prove that uh, Zoom app works everywhere. <laughs> It's also <laughs> for the newcomers that we need to demonstrate that Zoom app works everywhere. So, uh, yeah, so I'm in Portugal at the moment. I, I, I'm not driving yet because I don't want to be fined. Um, so there were some, Suzanne made a few questions throughout the week about the case study. I think uh, ultimately we will post them. So the idea of the case study was basically that you have a flavor of what transfer for pricing is. So it was supposed to be a very basic case study without too much analysis, without, well, almost any preparation so that you could just uh, understand what the, the essence or the core of, of the transfer pricing issues and the, the underlying discussions. From something, because, uh, Suzanne asked me about part four of my video. I think, William, you, you, you received it already or not? You didn't? I, I, I don't think so. I, I'm looking again right now, just to uh, one moment. Because I sent, I recorded everything and I, I thought I had sent everything. So I did record it every. Yeah, I couldn't see part four. Well. You you have you, you saw it, Joella, or not? I I could I couldn't find it. But I, I'm not sure. I think I sent everything to. I'm looking now. Um, to William, I sent it two separate element uh, uh, emails, part three and four. But I don't know. Otherwise, well, we we will uh, we will post it. I mean, actually, part four was not relevant for the purpose of this case study, but, but it's recorded anyways. Um, but okay, well. I don't, I don't see it. I'm, um, I'm. Otherwise I will send it, but I can only send it Tuesday because I'm returning Tuesday to Amsterdam. I don't have it here with me. But in any case, it is recorded already. I recorded everything on uh, Thursday. Parts three and four are recorded on Thursday before I left. But it was not, part four was not relevant for, for, the, for the case study. Um, anyways, we had four groups. Uh, so, Without further delay, maybe we should start yeah. hearing. You had it or not? You received it or not? No. no I, I will resend it again anyways. Because I did record it already. Uh, maybe we'll start with... If you have it, it will be on Thursday. Because that's when I send it. Maybe we'll start with group A. Oh, we have somebody new. We have actually two people who didn't introduce themselves okay. yet. Adam, Adam's here, and he didn't introduce himself, and his camera's on, so he has to tell the group who he is. And Daniela, she's new. So, um, 
Why don't we start with Adam saying who Adam is, what he does. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Brewer. Uh, I'm a tax attorney, uh, primarily based in San Diego, but uh, my practice is split between California and Hawaii. Uh, most of my work is tax controversy work for uh, individuals and small and medium businesses. So uh, I'm a sole proprietor, so I don't represent Fortune 500 companies, but uh, I am interested to learn more about transfer pricing um, and, and other international tax issues. I took the course last semester on international tax and really enjoyed it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to learning more about transfer pricing this semester. Nice bed, Adam. <laughs> this this actually is my kids' playroom. Uh, it's it's six a.m. here, so I'm like hiding, uh, not trying to turn on any lights because if I do, then I'll have two little kids running around, and then my wife will have to wake up, and she'll be grumpy. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually just hiding out in the playroom, trying to uh, to not disturb anyone. But you can call them. I mean, there's nothing better for kids than transfer pricing. <laughs> Uh, I think the four-year-old would really enjoy it. Um, the two-year-old, <laughs> not so much. Um, I did put them to sleep every night reading uh, Chapter 40 of uh, the Transfer Pricing book. So ah. um, they're, they're getting a bit of it. And you just, and, or, or otherwise, just play my videos. They will fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, looking, they're all looking forward to uh, the fourth video on Tuesday. Okay. And Daniela, you have to introduce yourself. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Daniela Bonet. Uh, I'm from Colombia. Uh, I went to law school there and currently I'm doing my transfer pricing uh, concentration. Um, I'm doing a master's degree here at the Bush School at A&M. Um, I'm in my second year. I took some transfer pricing courses with Lorraine Eden last year before she retired. And um, I worked for more or less six months with a transfer pricing law firm in Colombia. And now, uh, and after that, I moved here to do my master's degree. I'm looking forward to learning more of transfer pricing and international tax law, because that's what I did when I was there. I, I worked as a research assistant in transfer pricing and in international tax law in Colombia. But... <clears throat> mainly with South American countries. Oh, and Nabil is back. <laughs> Nabil is back also. Nabil, introduce yourself last week or you didn't? No, I did not. This is my first. Uh, you have to introduce yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Oh, of course. Admit. Yeah, well, uh, no shopping these days. That's all the money went out during Christmas and New Year, so. No more money. <laughs> Good to see you all here. Um, there is a couple of very familiar faces over here where uh, I'm so glad to see my group mate, Tianik, as well on board, which is great. My name is Nabil. I live in Bahrain, commercial lawyer um, from Syria originally. Um, I studied law in Syria, then in Beirut, Lebanon, and then got my master's degree from UK last year. And um, this year I'm working with you all guys on this uh, amazing LLM in international tax law, which I'm looking forward to understand more and more. Even we are living in a, in a in a jurisdiction where there is no tax at all, almost. We just pay VAT over here 5% and that's it. While uh, my, my job as an international commercial lawyer is to help my client to setting up and manage their entities in different jurisdictions. And most of them do that based on their commercial needs and on their tax implementation for their business. So it's very important to know how can, can I and my colleagues help 
our clients in a legal way to to set up their businesses and to understand what is allowed or not and what the what that would affect them uh, and their businesses so last semester we we, we had great time together. We learned a lot and looking forward to learn more during this semester. Just one thing, William, I checked and uh, you received the two videos on the last Thursday. At least I have the confirmation from WeTransfer. So, but maybe, I mean, maybe something happens with your email. Uh, just to, yeah. I mean, I didn't relate. Just, I'm, I'm not just, finding it. I'm I'm looking, but I'm not finding. I see the one, the two, and the three, but not not number four. I mean, what maybe check number? your inbox on uh, on Thursday. I don't know. I, otherwise, I will resend it. But just to confirm, I had the confirmation because when when I sent it via WeTransfer, you had the confirmation when it's the received by. Mm -hmm. by, by the, the way, week. Bruno, it's it's really unsafe behavior to check the confirmation while you are driving. It's. It's no, 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 risk. wait, I, I stopped the car. <laughs> ah, I'm not driving. You know, I'm a, I'm a safe guy. Ah, good, good. You know, Nabil, I be, just for one reason, I want to be sure that I'm able to lecture throughout the whole uh, program. Ah, so, understood. God bless. Thank you so much. I'm going to be involved in more, so I have to make sure that I'm uh, alive. That I'm able to, to be live. <laughs> Electric. <laughs> Indeed, looking forward. Keep safe, bro. Keep safe. Thank you very much. No, I, I, I parked, so, so I'm safe. Okay. Okay. Anyway, I mean, if William doesn't find it, when I'm back on Tuesday to Amsterdam, I, I will resend it, uh, and that's it. I think maybe, I don't know if there are any questions for now. Otherwise, should we go to the case study? Yeah, we've got group A, B, C, and D. Now, does anybody have to leave early? Because your group will go first. We have taxpayer, country A, country B, and our advocate general. Yeah, I need uh, to leave in about, in about an hour or so. Okay, so Joella, your group is D. You are the advocate general. Um, by the way, did y'all speak to Mark Ray? I didn't hear back from Mark. You yes. were um, the deal. Sorry. I, I didn't actually get to speak to him. Maybe Nabil, Nabil, did you speak to Mark? Well, I did not. I just discovered today when I got the registration into this semester that Mark is on board by seeing the whole groups and see the names on it. So unfortunately, no, I did not. Um, but I can do that tomorrow, indeed. Uh, I spoke, I spoke sure with Mark. Is on board or not. If he's not, then I'll remove him from the group. And, and, but uh, uh, looks like a, a week ago uh, that he was that he was going to enroll, but that was it. Looks like uh, he's on a, a business trip. Looks like okay. he's oh. a business trip. Okay, so he's in yeah. on a business. I mean, it's Sunday, so it's hard for him. Yes, but yes. remind him for tomorrow night that we're doing um, Lorraine Eden tomorrow. Okay. And I spoke with Bill Seeger, and he's also on board. He said he's going to show up. Yeah, I just, yeah, but he's on board. He's on board a cruise right now. No, he said next week. So I spoke with him last week. I just texted him. I said, you lazy guy. I mean, stop going on a cruise. We are all working. So show up. And he said, no worries. Next week, I'll be there. Yeah. So he will come. Okay. Okay. So let's start with our advocate general. So we have Pramod, Nathan, Caitlin, and Joella, Group D. And uh, who's the spokesperson for this week? Yeah, that's that's me. I Pramod, start you've been elected. Okay. Pramod, like so, to you give 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 us some wisdom, the court some wisdom of <laughs> how this should be treated. Yeah. So the we 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 I I think. Uh, Caitlin had cracked this case in 15 minutes. So uh, we were wondering how long did this uh, case actually take? So it will be good to know, to compare, because uh, we closed this case in 15 minutes. Well, <laughs> so the, I think we are on slide one. So we are representing here the advocate general position uh, on whether uh, the purchase price uh, 
uh, you know, by a company, could it be considered reasonable or not? So I think that was uh, the issue that we were analyzing. So I will I maybe lay out the facts. With something, is that the case was decided, then it was appealed and went to the Supreme Court. So it shouldn't be that easy to decide. Did it the take, real case? It real take took, uh, we took 15 minutes, so real case took how long? It just... Oh, it took took years, so it it went to the yeah, years, fifteen yeah. years. I, I don't know how long, <laughs> but quite some years. Yes, I mean okay. you know, it went to three instances, three levels of appeals. So, and the decision was reversed. So, okay, so okay, I mean you're the wise man. <laughs> the wise group, so some, you know it. Some sometimes it's better to give it give these complex cases to the layman people, they will solve it much faster. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, yeah, so we had, uh, maybe we'll start with the facts of the case. So that uh, licensing and the supply agreement, because uh, we are going first. So uh, we will lay out the facts of the case for everybody. So here we have a company, which is a subsidiary of XPT. XPT is the group that manufactures and distributes uh, pharmaceutical products worldwide. And A company distributes uh, uh, the drug in country A. The main component of this drug is an ingredient which is, uh, which is still uh, patented and uh, very valuable to the group. So that's uh, the first part of the facts that we have, uh, we understand. And we also have the fact that in order to get rights to sell these in products and ingredients in the country A, there is a license agreement that is entered into a separate license agreement between A um, and the parent. Um, and uh, the broad features of this agreement is that uh, it gives numerous rights to A company to obtain services, access to the intangibles, access to the mark, the brand name, the rights to manufacture and sell these products. The license agreement requires a 6% royalties um, on the sales of the product. And the license agreement also requires a company to enter into a supply agreement to buy and in this particular ingredient from the group's approved supplier. And that approved supplier happens to be B Company. Now, from the facts of this case, we understand that there is no dispute on the licensing agreement itself. So the whole dispute is around the facts uh, of, the, of the supply agreement. And uh, the, the the dispute which has been brought to our notice is that the amount paid by a company happens to be close to $1,000 uh, or more than that and more than $800 uh, more than what, you know, the generic producers in country A uh, would pay for, uh, for the ingredient similar to this particular ingredient. So that's where the dispute is it's uh, on the transpricing method that has been brought to our attention so uh, so far these are the facts as it is there and the issue that we have identified there are uh, obviously <clears throat> three issues that we have identified but before we get into that uh, our opinion to the judges is that the transfer pricing and taxation should be based on the actual nature of the transaction. It should not be based on what the parties could have done better. It should not be based on what, you know, maybe a generic companies would have done or what could have been a hypothetical situation. Our submission is that uh, we should be looking at the actual transactions. And unless, obviously, if the judges feel that this whole construction made by the parent uh, company is a sham or it lacks economic substance, then it's a completely different opinion and it's a, perhaps an easy judgment for the judges. But here, there's nothing in the facts 
that shows that this construction is lacking economic substance or it's abusive or anything like that. It's a straightforward, pure commercial arrangement implemented. There is sufficient people, substance and everything. So that's our assumption. It's, we forgot to ask these questions on the Wednesday class, but we have taken those assumptions into account. Now, the first issue, and there are three issues, as I said, that needs to be analyzed. The first issue is, should we go by a, a separate transaction or a package deal? Do we look at this whole structure in totality in as, a, as one package deal? Or do we analyze just the supply agreement separately and, and the license agreement separately? Um, the need to, you know, obviously the license agreement refers to the supply agreement. But the fact does not show whether the supply agreement also refers to the license agreement or not. And what has happened, and it's very unfortunate, I think they need better advisors, the taxpayer. Uh, what has happened is that the taxpayer has forgotten to mention in the supply agreement the reference to the license agreement. Or it looks like, it seems to be silent. Because if they had mentioned it, then the whole situation could have been different and there is no ambiguity here. We would have just applied an aggregate deal or a package deal. But because the taxpayer has forgotten to mention about the license agreement in the supply contract, the issue we are facing is, is there, should we look at this contract purely as a, as a, as a separate contract, completely delinked from the license agreement? Or could we say that we can go beyond the contract, language of the contract? and take a much bigger view. Look at the functions performed. Look at the situation, the market, the products, um, and the business strategy, and say that this should not be looked in isolation and go beyond the four corners of the contract. And I think we, and our opinion is that um, the taxpayer's intention seems to be to link the inter, both these contracts and our opinion is that we should go beyond the four corners of this supply contract and apply uh, what we say as a bundled approach and we will explain that in the subsequent slides. The second issue that we had is what is the right comparable? Once we say that we should look both the supply contract and the license contract together what should we compare this to? Should we compare it to generic uh, comparables, you know, the product companies that are buying at maybe 10% of the price or not? So here I draw an attention to the analogy that should a bottle of water that we buy at a grocery store, should it cost the same as a bottle of water at a Michelin restaurant? I hope not. So that's uh, one of our uh, contention that if if we are looking, it could be the same bottle of water, exactly. But do, do we need to go beyond just looking at the price to price and rather look at the circumstances where the, the, the audience is, where the client is, look at the captive situation of being in a Michelin restaurant and, and being able to order a bottle of water and should the tax administration try and change that price to say that that should exactly match the price of what is there in a grocery store. Maybe it should be just a dollar. That is the issue here. And if we all agree that the price of the bottle can be 10 times more expensive in a, in a Michelin restaurant than in a grocery store, then what should be the method that we should apply to justify this 10 times increase? Should we look at uh, the the best method should we look go beyond the price method or should we go into what we call as the profitability method and see what's the right profit of this entity compare the profits of this entity a company with the market situation or the do the look at the profits of the b company and compare it with the market situation so that is the last issue, and that's where uh, we want to analyze uh, using the guidelines and the transfer pricing guidelines. 
So if we go into the next slide and we go into each of these three issues, as I explained, we will take the first issue up, whether it is a, a bundled deal or the separate deal, our analysis and the memo that has been prepared by the team is that uh, uh, the situation is quite vague. Clearly, OECD, as usual, gives both views. It also talks about closely linked and certain cases aggregate approach, but it also talks about tra transaction by transaction approach and everything depends on the facts of the case. So here, we have not done a detailed transfer pricing study, but uh, our view from what the facts suggest is that clearly this company is in a dif completely different situation compared to generic companies. It's, its characteristics are different. The product is a very valuable product. Its functional anal analysis is different. There is a clear value adding function from this activity there is um, you know quality there is a level of risks being assumed are completely different um, the 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 contractual terms are different the situation and the market are also quite different from a generic company so so therefore um, using the guidelines of oecd uh, the un manual and also the various rules that are there in the country which talk about what as a, as a step transaction to look at the big picture and go beyond the you know the four corners of the contract especially with the fact that the contract is ambiguous it is not reflecting the intention of the parties and therefore our recommendation to the judges is that uh, they should go beyond the four corners of this contract and look at the big picture. And the big picture clearly is a package deal. Uh, one cannot work without the other. And therefore, uh, our view is that the comparison and the method should be based on a package deal and not based on a single contract. Moving on to the next slide, um, we have, uh, once we are like in agreement that it's a package deal, it completely changes the comparison. If in a package deal, I would not be able to compare with a generic company. That is for sure because a generic company and a high end uh, uh, research bearing, risk bearing pharma company are not compatible. And therefore I cannot compare the price to price. Um, here I have to look at the characteristics of the product, the function analysis, the contractual terms and the economic uh, situation and the business strategy. So the argument we want to make is that clearly the tax administration's approach to compare the prices is not correct. It needs to go beyond that. It would need to look at a different method. And um, and then the last slide, uh, the, the next slide is basically on what should be the best method. And here, our view is that uh, as the taxpayer mentioned, looking at the profitability, look at the what uh, this premium, this product commands in the market and that extra additional profitability um, should be used as a basis to defend the at a net margin level, the profitability with compared to the margins earned by the generic companies. So if, if by selling a, you know, a premium product, I'm able to get the same level of margin, uh, I'm justified to make that premium payment for the products uh, that I buy. So it's looking at the net margins and as long as the net margins are sufficient, uh, our argument is that the tax administration should not make any adjustment. So that's our conclusion that uh, to summarize three things, package deal, uh, look at uh, net margins and uh, look at the best method, uh, uh, you know, which is uh, corresponding to net margins. So that ends our uh, position and uh, that's our recommendations to the judges. Any questions?
Well, who's the taxpayer group? Um, Just to clarify the case, it took 20 years. We, we took 25, 15 minutes plus five minutes to prepare, so 20 minutes. 20 years in courts. <laughs> yeah, but this is what the highest <laughs> opinion of a judge that belonged before to a big multinational enterprise. So that's... What is our taxpayer group? Group A, think about this package deal and you can't compare um, the generics and all this. Uh, so we have uh, Montecizzo, Susanna, Mark's not here, but Paula, who's representing group A, our taxpayer? Me, Susan. Susan? Me, yes. Okay. Do you agree <laughs> with the um, advocate general that uh, in essence, your entire transfer pricing rate to just blow it out of the water. It's just not um, acceptable. What, what's your opinion? What are y'all uh, putting forward? Yes. Uh, I, I, I'll come to our analysis. Uh, as we do that, uh, you see from the case that uh, Taxpayer, uh, our group, group A, we represent for uh, taxpayer, Rico, uh, decided to, to appeal from this decision. Uh, in ECO point of view, the generic producer price are not comparable. The same with the uh, CFK general. Uh, as we do comparability analysis of the case uh, through some comparability factors, attribute of transaction or enterprise that affect condition in arm's length transaction. First, uh, for the characteristic of the goods transferred. So, Omeprazol purchased by ECO from Vigo uh, was manufactured under XPT Group Gold Standard of Good Manufacturing Practice and uh, produced in accordance with the XPT Group Good Safety and Environmental Standard. Uh, this good manufacturing uh, practice and work health safety environmental standards indicate a uh, better or more uh, premium product than generic one. So, uh, so even uh, Prisolet Omeprazole and generic Omeprazole were chemically equivalent and bioequivalent, but the manufacturing process and health safety and environmental standard of Prisolet Omeprazole is different from the generic one. Uh, this could command a premium for omeprazol over the generic drugs and hence uh, ECO would be willing to pay more for the means by which to sell the non-generic version. And this is lead to a uh, non-comparable for characteristic of the goods itself. Second, uh, we analyze this from the economic circumstance of the parties and of the relevant market. Uh, as economic circumstance between uh, ECO and other generic drugs companies uh, are driven and lead to uh, non-comparable for economic circumstance. Without the license agreement, uh, ECO would have uh, had access to the portfolio of uh, patent and trademark products to which it has uh, access under the license agreement. It means ECO wouldn't have uh, been in position to use uh, omeprazole patent and if ECO would have been to enter the generic market, the cost of entry to that market uh, would likely have been high considering that uh, other generic drugs companies were already well placed and positioned. So uh, consequently in those uh, open to ECO would have been to enter license agreement with the XPT and ECO must conclude both license agreement and also supply agreement as required uh, in the license agreement uh, to purchase omeprazole from XPT Group approved supplier with the consequence that the generic drug producer price are not 
comparator as business and economic consequences are driven. So uh, the agreement for omeprazole was uh, one set, license agreement and supply agreement for intangible, them itself, and tangible, the product omeprazole, and the prices paid by ECO to PECO uh, were a payment for a bundle of uh, at least some rights and benefits under the license agreement and product under the supply agreement. So uh, we think that uh, our conclusion that uh, this is also a, a bundle, so we cannot analyze this as a transaction by transaction approach for this case. That's our opinion. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, so this, you're, you're really, you're agreeing with the Advocate General? With, is, is that what's Yes, uh, so, yes, uh, so we have to analyze this as uh, one package, license agreement and then a supply agreement. So I understand why, I get, you're the taxpayers, right? Yes. So I think I understand why you're making that argument, but why did the, I guess, Pramod, that would be more of a question for you, though. Why, why, why would the Advocate General make that argument? I'm, I'm kind of confused. The, we, we are a neutral party. We represent what we think uh, the right view is. So if the taxpayer has taken the right position, we, we don't have any favoritism. So <laughs> if that's the right position, we recommend the right position. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but the Advocate General doesn't necessarily have to be against the taxpayer. It's a, it's a neutral body. Yeah. Yeah, the Advocate General just suggests what the court should decide. Yeah. Can be in favor of the taxpayer, the tax authorities, or even saying different. Yeah, because I know in some jurisdiction, Advocate General is paid by the government and because sometimes he's under pressure to give an opinion that favors the tax administration, but uh, we are a very neutral team here. We are not being paid by anybody. Okay, but I have a question, which is, it's in the facts of the case that they say, well, the generic, both parties agree that the generic component uh, is exactly the same, feels exactly the same uh, goals as the the product that is being sold by, by ACO. So why the price should be different? I mean, we're talking about the same, they recognize the raw material is exactly the same, so why should it be different? Yes. yes. Uh, okay, uh, the... could, I, could I say something yes. on that one? Okay. Okay, so, uh, so even if you have the same components, um, like we mentioned in the appeal, uh, there, there are certain things which we need to look at. When we're talking about the uh, the circumstances, that was one of the issues we raised at the appeal. So we're not talking about the, the good, it's the, 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 the particular um, product, but we're talking about the circumstances we faced. And, uh, you know, when you talk about that, you, you, in, a, in, um, in the arms ninety, we need to look at the, there are like uh, five, um, this was not just a one of, transaction on its own. So you have the supply agreement and the license agreement. Um, you need to also look at the functions performed. Now, if you compare our functions alongside uh, the, 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 the comparables, which are those who have the, 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 the generic, um, we were at a higher risk because um, we were also uh, going to uh, manufacture goods from the group as well. So our contract, uh, our supply agreement was also tied with another agreement. So we were facing, we're actually facing a higher risk than the, the corporation, the, the companies who run the generic. Um, you also have to look at the characteristics of the property transferred. And I think this, this, this is quite important because not just are we um, um, doing the particular good, but it's kind of roped with the goodwill of the bigger company um, so this, this, this particular, um, yes, it might have the same chemical components, but then again, um, like they said, um, we're also, we're also looking at the standard, the health and safety issues, um, the standard of 
the group as well. So it's kind of very different um, from the comparison with uh, the other companies. Um, again, you know, we, but we also wait, look wait, wait. But the, 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 the judges here from uh, Texas A&M are worried with something. I mean, based on your arguments, it's always possible that if you bundle two contracts, you say, well, sorry, our, our situation is different, so we can charge a different price. Basically, the argument is always, sorry, always well, we have to bundle contracts so we can charge whatever we want to. I mean, we understand the arguments, but as judges, we need to set... Uh, precedents for future decisions and if we go just based on that we it seems like every time you have you've bundled two contracts you can charge a higher price sorry i didn't get that can you repeat that part again i was i didn't get exactly what you're saying so, what 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 i'm saying is that well as as judges we sympathize with your arguments but what we are worried is that if we decide in accordance with your uh line of reasoning that was also raised by by the advocate general is that it seems that every time you, you, you bundle two contracts, you say, well, this contract is linked to the other, then you can always argue that the circumstances are different, so you can charge a different price. So what we are worried is that, well, in a group situation, you can always bundle contracts because basically in a group situation, you can always say, set more or less the, the, the legal environment that you want. So if that is the core issue, uh, doesn't this offer possibilities for, for planning? Because, you know, in a group situation, you can always bundle contracts, possibly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I do appreciate the concerns of the, the judges. Um, but again, what, what we are doing is, is, a, is a actually standard. And I think these, these concerns have actually been um, in the transport pricing guideline. There, there, were, there were things like this, which we talked about. Um, and then it was noted at, I think, uh, paragraph 1.2, that um, not every in a in a in a in a group uh, situation you wouldn't always find the same circumstances as you would find between um, independent people. Now, what we've done, following uh, the statement, we have to even look at what the, um, the the tax authorities have said. What we have is a reasonable price adjustment. We've actually done something which is reasonable. Um, it's a reasonable price adjustment because if you look at the some cases we have. Um, like the Frank um, International Canadian Corporation, which is a 1962 case. Um, it says something about a reasonable or at arm's length. So um, if we're not, we're, we're looking at um, reasonability, we don't want to look at the arm's length because the arm's length is not giving us the exact figures which um, um, will be fair to the company. So what we're doing is we're having a reasonable price adjustment. And I think the idea of a reasonable price adjustment has actually been supported in the case of, um, it was also supported in the case of Johnson Bones and Commissioner, uh, which is also uh, a 1965 case. So um, yes, I understand the, 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 the um, concerns. Uh, yes, the, we understand the concerns of the judge, but what we are saying is it's within the standards um, and um, it's within what has been accepted globally and also from this um, place as well. And there are precedents to it. So I don't think we're doing anything out of the ordinary. If we have future case situations where we are faced with challenges, um, we wouldn't run at a loss all because we're trying to avoid uh, or we're trying to underprice or we're trying to over, uh, just because we think um, we're, we're trying to look at the, 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 the issues with the, um, with the group or uh, what would have happened at an independent situation, we would always look at the standards. And I think as a company and as a group, we've always had good practices and we have our standards and we're not really willing uh, to drop those standards. So okay. uh, I don't think the judges should have any concern at, at this mo moment with this okay. particular issue. Thank you. Still, I mean, I think the judges are interested to hear what the tax authorities have to say since they triggered the, the readjustment. So we would like to invite the tax authorities to come. And in the meantime, the judges also want to give props for Daniela because she's a true maroon. She's wearing a, a maroon t-shirt, which is something that William always makes sure to, to highlight. So very good, Daniela. I mean, you're very eggy. That's because she's on main campus. Yeah, she's, on main she's campus. At the Mecca. So it's mandatory on main campus. You cannot step outside main campus without a maroon t-shirt. <laughs> So now it's group B, right? 
No, or or C. I can't, I don't remember. Tax group, authority. Group C. So you have two. You have the two governments. Group B representing state A and group C okay. representing state B. So group B so, would be interesting. Oh, you're also maroon promote. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just forgot tie. my... <laughs> you should be wearing your tie. Come on. Next week, <laughs> your tie. Your maroon tie. I mean, that's, that's the way it should be. Okay. Um... Well, good morning, everyone, and good evening to whoever are in zones where it's the night. Oh, uh, Frank is in his bed, as always. Very good. <laughs> I, was I never saw for... you outside the environment of your bed, so that's why it's so funny. I'm <laughs> sorry. You, that's you get, good. No worries. You, you get to, to see other, <laughs> other environments at some point. Uh, anyway, um, it was it was good hearing uh, all the arguments for all the, from all the different groups. Uh, we are Group B. We represent State A's tax jurisdiction, and um, uh, we have quite a different approach to looking at uh, the bundling of these agreements. So, I think we've all gone over uh, the facts, and um, it did not take as long for us to be able to take our position as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, I would provide to everyone else what our position is and how we came to uh, be in a position or feel confident to be in a position where we can reassess the tax base of CoA based on its agreements. So as, um, as tax authorities of, of uh, country A, <clears throat> We've decided to view the transaction not from a, I mean, we can view it from a, from a transaction per transaction or agreement per agreement type of thing, but we can also view it from a, um, a, a global market performance perspective. And even when we do that, even when we view it from the way that the Advocate General or the taxpayer would view it, we have positions that uh, strengthen our position or we have, um, we find things that strengthen our position. So um, when we analyze the circumstances of the business of any entity that gets into business to make profit, we would like to hope that most of these entities have aims of minimizing the cost and maximizing the profits. As such, rather than directly transfer in our own view, its own manufactured price select, which seems to cost uh, way more than the generic company's uh, production cost within country A uh, for any business entities that are into business to maximize their profits. We would like to think that it would be, it is a, it's an option that makes uh, more of a, a business and economical sense to be able to reduce your cost by $800 by purchasing the uh, generic company's um, price select within country A. And we also understand that uh, the uh, manufacturing processes or uh, any of the other uh, national and international governmental regulations that the XPT group has to meet would, at the end of the day, always make the uh, total production cost of XPT in any given country that has high regulatory uh, requirements to be met, <clears throat> be higher than the, the total production cost of the generic uh, companies. But um, given the fact that Price Select is a multinational uh, entity group, in order for them to keep on competing or keep on performing at the level that they are, from a global standpoint, it will also help them to be able to reduce the cost as much as possible so it can be as close as possible to the cost of the generic companies because um, when, you, when you commingle um, the quality of the products that they provide with the goodwill of the company, and if you can do that at a lower cost, we believe that's uh, an alternative that as mentioned earlier, any uh, business entity would want to uh, use. Um, with this, we don't understand 
um, why, first off, we don't understand the diff what caused the exact difference between the uh, generic company's uh, uh, product and uh, XPT's uh, product, given that from a pure pharmaceutical analysis uh, research result, both us and the XPT group have concluded that uh, the main ingredient within the product that provides the main um, healing solution to the clients uh, within XPT's group's price select and within the generic company's price select are bioequivalent. So they act in the same way, they provide the same benefits. And to the extent to which in the future they will provide some negative, some negatives, these are all equal. So um, it, it, it therefore reinforces our view, um, our view that the transaction in and of itself was a transaction to reduce the profits that will be uh, taxable in our country. And even though we approach XPT Group uh, as the tax authority within our tax agency, we have uh, individuals that are um, specialized in analyzing the economical impacts of uh, business activities from countries to countries. And um, every argument that we just brought forward are arguments that were not concluded by uh, the section of our tax agencies that are taxation guys, but it was more so concluded by the section of our tax agencies that are uh, well geared to handle uh, these type of situations. And they analyze them from an economical impact uh, uh, in the country and also from a, uh, to be more specific from the, with the view lenses of a transfer pricing specialist. So that's, that's the first point. The second point is we, we took it a, a notch further and we looked at uh, the situation of XPT from a worldwide standpoint than just from a country A's, <clears throat> than just from what the economical impact of, uh, of not providing that profit to country A would be. And we looked at the business cycle in which the XPT group is currently. Um, we concluded that they are in their their peak phases, and as such, for any company that operates on a global scale, and that is in its peak phases, profits would the uh, the uh, the management of the company would want for the profits to be maximized during these peak phases in all of the jurisdictions in which the multinational group is involved. If that's the case, again, we go back to the difference in prices between uh, manufacturing its own uh, 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 product and, and, and purchasing it at a price that is $800 to $850 higher than what the cost would have been if it was uh, purchased from a generic producing company. Um, and that the, the, the position taken on the single transaction does not agree or does not does not match what the expectations of a reasonably competent board of directors or management in a multinational that is in uh, this step of the business cycle would take. Um, so while we understand while we understand the argument that were brought forward to us about um, the cost being high because of the uh, the more because of the excessive requirements that the XPT group has to meet in order for them to operate globally, while we understand um, also that uh, the quality of of the product in and of itself that XPT wants to offer to its clients may cause for uh, an increase in cost. We 
do not give such we do not give value to the argument about quality because we were able to determine in this specific instance that whether it's a whether it's a product provided by the uh, the uh, generic company or a product that was manufactured in house the, the benefits are the same so the quality of performance of the product uh, to its to to its clients is the same. We would, however, be open to uh, uh, receiving a study that shows what the excessive or the excess cost caused by the excessive governmental regulation requirements that need to be met for the XPT group to be able to operate on a worldwide basis is. And to that, we would take the, um, we would take the higher range of the cost of the actual drug to the generic companies, add on to that the the excessive or the excess cost that holds a uh, reasonable sense in terms of um, what the business needs to do in order for it to run appropriately from a global standpoint. And that for us would qualify as being an appropriate transfer price, not the transfer price that was provided to us on the tax return. So, and that is it. I wouldn't mind breaking at that point to to bring in the last group to comment representing their country how they see it. So uh, and that would be Odit. No, that's uh, sorry, Daniel Kelly, <coughs> Tyler Adams group. Who's who's representing Group C? Uh, I am. Dan. So, okay. depending, gotcha. so um, depending on the position of. Uh, State B, it may mean that State B may do an adjustment or not to the tax base if they agree that the adjustment of State A is correct. Well, without with, without spoiling it for everyone, I will um, <clears throat> I will uh, give us a presentation of uh, B nation state. So I think the summary of findings, and, and I'll be brief here because we've um, we've kind of discussed this fairly at length, but our, our view is that the arm's length principle was violated. The price paid by A company to B company was unreasonably greater than the price that generic drug companies paid for the chemical and bioequivalent ingredient. And as country B, we feel that B company should receive a relief of, of 46 million as we find that the adjustment paid by state A was justified and in the proper amount. What we base this decision on is OECD model tax convention article 9 sub 2, uh, specifically the section that says profits so included are profits which would have accrued to the enterprise of the first mentioned state if the conditions made between the two enterprises had been those which would have been made between independent enterprises, then that other state shall make an appropriate adjustment to the amount of the tax charged and therein on those profits. What this effectively means is that the price paid by A company to B company would not have been unreasonable in a comparable transaction between unrelated parties. 
but the equivalent ingredients to those purchased by a company would have been obtained at a significantly reduced price from other suppliers. Now, in the facts, we couldn't find anything to suggest that a company's business circumstances were sufficiently different from the generic companies to support that 400% increase in the price of the raw materials. And with that in mind, the only thing of value to differentiate the products sold by a company was the license of the trademark. That's the 6% royalty paid by a company directly to XBT group. But again, B country or uh, nation state B feels that this, the loan does not justify the 400% increase in the price. So our conclusion is that the tax authority of state B finds that the adjustment made by state A was justified and in the proper amount. So state B therefore agrees that B company should receive the adjustment in the amount of 46 million. And then um, if we have any comments or, or questions. Taxpayer, do you have anything to say? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I was just going to say something. And I was just going to react to uh, uh, one of the points made by uh, the tax authorities of State A. Um, and it had to do with the, um, at a point he said the, the products, um, the generic products were cheaper um, as compared to the Prisolec Omeprazole. Uh, I'd just like to add that at this point, we don't have the details of the cost, the, the product cost. Um, there's no information on the product cost, so it will be difficult to say if the if it was cheaper. However, let's uh, make an assumption. We would like to make an assumption that the presolic omeprazole was uh, is a quite is more expensive product, and uh, we also like to make the assumption that yeah, it's way more expensive than the generic product as well. But then they have the same quality. Um, however, as uh, as he rightly mentioned. Um, the group is at its uh, peak stage, and we happen to be market leaders. And part of our strategy is uh, we're bringing out uh, products which are going to be taken by um, a different class of people who are ready to spend as much as they, they want to spend um, on particular medication. So we don't think um, it's, it's our business strategy, which um, has been accepted, will be respected uh, um, even the, the transfer pricing guideline which says it's okay to, um, the, the, the business strategy should be put into consideration. So um, our business strategy is to work with expensive goods because we're, we have a different type of markets as compared to um, the, 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 those who are being used as a comparable. So um, we don't think uh, the fact that we use a cheaper product should um, be one which is contested right now. Uh, I think that's that's something which I wanted to 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 mention right now. Yeah, and we we since we control the market, we can actually take higher risks. So that's uh, and then we're ready. We can do anything we, because we control the market. So it's not something that should be contested by the tax authorities. Yeah, thank you. What about state hey, A? Go ahead. And I should just interject real quick um, on behalf of state B, just for clarification. It seems like there's like two arguments are maybe being pushed together. And one is, but at least the way I took it is because the final product is sold for a higher price, it justifies paying more for equivalent raw ingredients. And I think Pramod made that point um, with regards to a bottle of water. Um, so I, I guess I'm just looking for some clarification on that point because I understand the bottle of water can be sold for more at the Michelin a uh, restaurant, but does that in and of itself justify paying, say, four times more for that bottle of water um, outside the restaurant? Um, meaning the Michelin restaurant isn't going to go to their suppliers and say, yeah, mark it up, you know, 400%. I'm going to charge my customer an outrageous amount. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering if that logic if that holds, I know in the U S like the IRS is going to hold us to the standard. Uh, I think it's ordinary and necessary. So if you go, Oh, I paid 
six dollars for this bottle of water because i can sell it to my customer for 10 they're still going to go yeah but you could have got that at costco for 50 cents so we're not going to allow that deduction so maybe if a uh, taxpayer or um yeah. advocate general could give some clarification on that yeah uh just to uh i think that still boils back to what we, I, was, I was just uh, mentioning right now i think it has more to do with our business strategy and also the the market segment, um, you're not going to get, uh, like you mentioned, the bottled water. Um, it depends on where you're buying the bottled water. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a different price in different parts of the world. It could even be as much as a 400% difference um, in, a, in a restaurant in New York and a restaurant in somewhere in, uh, let's say, in Kenya or something. So, uh, if, if we're looking at the end product and the difference, it could be as massive as possible. That's what we're saying. But it all depends on how, what, we, what, we look, what we've looked at is uh, the, the, the process, uh, the marketing strategy. That's where we're really holding on to. And uh, our marketing strategy is that we are um, we're basing our products for a class of people. Our products are not for everybody. So the generic, uh, the generic products can go to uh, a specific type of people, but we we make more profit when we bring in new um, exotic uh, medications that that feel fine in the mouth, and we tell you it tastes different. It doesn't. It's our strategy, yeah. So we're doing what we want to do. Um, so I don't think unless you want everybody to sell the same product, just to have the transfer pricing successful, uh, then all of us should sell one product. There should be no innovation. Uh, there should be no business strategy. We all do the same thing. And I don't think the world is going to get to that point. So, um, yeah, the water, the, the water idea, I think it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So j just, just, just to add, uh, the reason I brought the water example was basically to say that we cannot apply the price method. We cannot compare price to price because a bottle of water, you know, costs very different in a different market and a different situation. So it was just to say that we need to apply a better method and not the price method. And what is the better method? Because the price uh, method requires very strict comparability in terms of the situation. When, when can you apply this method of price method is when it's exactly identical uh, to the two situations. So that we only try to bring out the fact that it's not exactly identical with a generic company because this but is if a I could just different stop setting. you there, Pramod. I think it's in the facts that the taxpayer already conceded that it's it is the equivalent. Isn't that the whole premise of this case? Like it's not a different bottle of water, it's not different raw ingredients, it doesn't yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. taste different in the mouth. I think that point yeah, was conceded the, the, in the, the bottle facts. the bottle of water is exactly the same. I concede that point. The bottle of water is exactly the same, but the setting where it is sitting on a nice table in a Michelin restaurant versus a grocery store is a different setting. So, yeah. And therefore, I'm that, with you there. Therefore, you, we cannot compare the price between, it's not identical settings. It's not identical circumstances. So we have to compare what is reasonable circumstance. So here, <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to be, same circumstances even if the product is exactly identical yeah. it is not the same circumstances that's what, so, what our argument was so then so then so then promote we i guess your position and our position comes to the same conclusion uh our conclusion was not that we want um we want the 250 or the generic companies to represent the cost right we would take that because that's the value of the bottle in and of itself that's the value of the product and how it performs uh in its clients and we will, we were open to adding to that cost uh the excess cost that it takes to move the bottle from the grocery store to the restaurant and even when we do so we still there still is a huge gap between the actual transfer price that was reported and the, the transfer price that is calculated based on these based on this fair evaluation of what the transfer price should be and if i can add to that i don't think that you guys are giving the example of a water bottle but in that obviously a you know a non-generic something is going to be sold to a consumer at a higher price because they extract value from their intangibles from their brand and all that 
But if the water is the exact same, whereas here, like the price should be the exact same for the bioequivalent medical drug because it's it's from the supplier. It's not obviously you're going to sell it at a higher price to the consumer because you know you extract value from the intangible, being able to sell it as Zantac or whatever instead of the off-brand. But you're going to sell it at a higher price to a consumer. But I don't understand why you would pay a a higher price to the manufacturer or supplier. Yeah, I agree. Going off of what Brandy just said, it seems like the argument's getting confused as to whether it almost seems more like we're arguing. Um, is ACO justified in charging their customer this price, like the end consumer, let's say $2,000 a month for a prescription when they could have that same prescription filled from a generic company for $100. Um, but in, I think the actual issue is, is ACO justified in paying $1,000 when their competitors are only paying $300 for the equivalent raw product. So I guess, I mean, I understand from ACO's perspective, like their final costs, they have 6% licensing. Like that's justified because now they get to use the brand name. Um, they have greater marketing costs than a generic company because they are the, the market leader and they're actively, you know, pushing these products where the generic company is more passive. But to say that those arguments justify paying more for the bioequivalent um, raw materials. It, it just doesn't seem like the arguments are getting there, at least from a state B perspective. And, and, and to add to, to Adam's point, you, they, can, they can purchase the uh, generic raw materials from the generic companies and still, like he was saying, still be able to go through the regular process of doing, uh, putting out marketing advertisement, uh, putting their brand on that product, I don't think customers would know at the end of the day, since the, the performance of the drug is the same, that uh, it, it wasn't a an in-house manufactured drug product by the XPT group. Yeah, they so can again, add, yeah. Okay. yeah, the argument we made was based on what is the actual nature of the transaction. So not based on what parties could have done better. Obviously, it would have been made sense for a company to buy from generic companies and reduced its cost or whatever. But here, uh, the whole position is based on what has happened, not but what could have happened or what uh, I don't think we could change the nature of the transaction. Maybe the taxpayer could have done it better. But that's not what we would make an opinion on. We would make an opinion on what has actually happened. What has actually happened is that they have been asked to buy from B company under a license agreement. If they violate that license agreement, uh, they don't get that access to the brand. They won't get access to the group's uh, technology and things like that. So they are, A company is forced to do act in a certain manner in under the contract. And therefore, um, we are just looking at the actual situation that happens today. If A company is asked to buy this bottle of water from from only from B and not from anybody else in order to get the license access to the trademark, etc. Then we have to respect that contract. We have to respect that transaction, the actual transaction. Perhaps there could have been a better way. Yeah, I agree that they could have bought it from a grocery store directly and reduced, made more money. But that's not what has actually happened in the case study. The case study clearly says they're not allowed to go and buy from a grocery store. They are only supposed to buy from B company. And if they violate that term, they lose access to this brand name. They lose access to the group and they will be out. They will not be able to sell this at this high premium price. So uh, my point is, my point is that uh, we are not going to question what the parties could have done better. We are not going to, question the change the nature of the transaction we are just respecting what is the real transaction and we are just aggregating those steps in order to say that this is not a sham or this is not a, a abuse abusive transaction it is a legitimate business deal and therefore they have uh, in order to get that premium to the product they are uh, they had to pay this uh, extra price 
So uh, I want to interject. I want to interject my American hat, and then Bruno and I can have an argument. <laughs> okay, so wearing my American hat, pro pharma, pro innovation, pro how we got here today. I haven't heard anybody mention the product life cycle. We're talking about the end game and where we're at at this moment in the life cycle of this transaction that brings us the potential for a generic. But I haven't, had it, I haven't heard yet anybody mention the billions of dollars that went to, of the manufacturer side, that, uh, or the group side that gets put into the manufacturing process that takes this combination and creates that outcome. Once the patent's gone, the generic's easy and cheap because they learned from that initial product R&D investment and innovation over here, which I'm just calling the American side. So how are we to price or how are we comparing the product life cycle of a, a brand drug that has a billion here, and then it has to compete against generics here after the patent's gone, where it seems quite expensive because the generics don't have that billion input needing to be recaptured over time to give this company and its product life cycle a good rate of return, an ROI over the time of the, of the entire product life cycle. And this is not including bundling any other products that failed along the way. Okay, so I'm just throwing that out there as, as, a, as an American call it uh, perspective. And, um, and any comments on why we aren't looking at product life cycle to determine our price uh, point is okay. Well, would it, wouldn't they have recouped that over the time that they had a patent, like the 10 or 20 years? Wouldn't they have recouped all that? So aren't we at the point where now there is a generic competing, but they should have recouped all that while there wasn't allowed to be generics? Yeah, um, the, the point that I will bring towards the professor's point is <clears throat> the, financial accounting, the financial accounting principle in the U.S., of the matching principle, which is which is essentially what uh, Randy was saying right now, which is uh, throughout the years, while they invest those billions, they also have revenues that are directly tied to those billions. The only way that that um, the investment, the prior investment, would be taken into account when we do our pricing is if during the periods in which they were investing the billions, there weren't any uh, there were losses and and those losses were substantial then we'll be able to understand that um, the the future revenues should be directly tied to the prior year investments and as such we should bake into the pricing currently the future revenues which would be able to reduce the current taxable income yeah, and which would help us be able to pretty much take into account the taxable loss that were taken that were incurred in the past, and in a way, kind of helps the company avoid, even though it's not really double taxation, but avoid double taxation from a from a not great gate point of view. I would argue on behalf of the company that the, the, you know, generics and the, and the brand drug really aren't the same. Even though at this point in time, when this audit occurred, the comparable in the, in, in, from, the, from the auditor's point of view looks at ingredients, ingredients. Okay, I'll give you something for your marketing or this past, but it's really ingredient, that's how they're looking at it. Whereas as, as, as the company, financial accountant in the big group picture, I'm looking at, I have uh, spent a billion, my product life cycle 
does bring me to this point in time where I'm being challenged by generics. However, I still need to capture a much because the product life cycle requires that I'm going to have to come down some small amount or I'm going to lose a lot of revenue. It requires that I capture enough money still at this point to feed back into my new product life cycle of other products where I'm going to be innovative in ingen ingenuity. I'm going to take other combinations and create new outcomes and get a patent and so on, which are all but high risk. And there's a lot of loss built in along the way. Loss meaning the products that we never see. So the one product we see is the one we're talking about today, or actually a combination of, of ingredients that we have a brand name for and then a generic name for. That's what we see. What we don't see is the combination of these ingredients in 12 other different ways that my company, if I'm USA, spent money on. We don't see those losses because those products didn't make it to market. They maybe only made $100 million of investment, maybe $50 million. They never had branding. They never had marketing. They just failed. They didn't make it through the trials, perhaps. Um, regardless, that's my wearing my... Uh, but actually, I, I think would argue given that argument, it, it somehow implied in that uh, argument B that uh, the company makes. That they say, well, we produce these under the standards, under the quality, uh, under the producing standards of the company, which I think somehow implies those arguments, William, that you just raised. So that's the typical kind of argumentation that, that a multinational will do. And I think they are implied that in the case. In, uh, there are two sets of arguments. One, the bundling of the contract. Then the sub B is to say, these are different standards, a different methodology, and so on. So I think they are somehow implied there. Uh, but on the other hand, if you follow strictly... Uh, William's arguments probably could be that there's never nothing is ever comparable because when you're talking about these kinds of products, right? Because I mean, ultimately means this is every special product that is produced that has a particular intangible, you can never compare it, which partly, partially it's true because intangibles is one of the most difficult areas in terms of pricing. May I add something? Yeah. Doesn't uh, Professor Burns' oh. argument also, oh, sorry, does it oh. not imply that the 6% royalty was artificially low? Like if they need, if XPT Group needs to extract additional profits because this is their, you know, one in 10 products that actually makes it to market, it, it seems like 6%, a 6% 6 royalty for, you know, the, the risk and costs involved is low. So at the same time, I understand the, the point of the pharmaceutical company, but it, that's not really an argument that ACO or BCO would be making. That's like an XPT argument. Um, so it, at, from a state A perspective, and I'm not state A, but it, it seems like that almost supports their position that there's some not arm's length transaction going on here because to to pay for these developments, they've you know, they've now they're overcharging their own companies for um, the equivalent raw materials. And and to to add to Adam's point, <clears throat> I would say that now we're speaking from the tax section of our state tax aid tax agency. All of those losses that are incurred in relation to the products that fail the market, they do receive a tax benefit from an NOL standpoint. They also do receive a tax benefit from a tax uh, R&D credit standpoint. So even if we want to take the, the, the failed invested capital into account when we want to uh, calculate our price, I think it would be very close to, <clears throat> if we're still looking at um, the 27, because we just had our 2017 in the US Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, before the corporate used to be 35%. So 35% uh, of the invested capital would already not be taken into account. 
and R&D credits would come in anywhere between 15 to 25 percent. So that would be 35 plus if you want to say 20 percent, that would be 55 percent. So 55 percent of that invested capital has been recuperated via <coughs> the filing of tax returns or the combining of uh, the losses entities with the, the gaining entities and via the receiving of uh, R&D credits. So while we agree that that may um, that aspect may be taken into account when we compute our price, uh, our transfer price, we don't think that it will have uh, a significant impact in increasing the actual uh, transfer price between the related companies. Susan, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yes. Uh, uh, when I read uh, a case, uh, almost the same with uh, this, this case, uh, and uh, you speak for uh, reference also. Uh, in our case, that uh, there's a statement that uh, for the tax authority, the supply agreement was essentially an agreement to pay for the raw material received from B2 and nothing more. Moreover, the generic drug companies were also paying for the raw material and nothing more. So uh, I think that the tax authorities uh, trying to do a, a split uh, between license agreement and the supply agreement. So they, they use it uh, and analyze it, it as a transaction by transaction approach. That's uh, they do in my reference case uh, at the tax court. And then uh, it's moved to a federal court and Supreme Court, but the federal and Supreme Court uh, not use a transaction by transaction approach. Uh, they are using a, a bundle or package uh, analysis. So that's why uh, the price is more higher uh, as an additional for the, the premium products. And, and further, uh, the analysis uh, is also uh, mentioned that uh, for the tax authority, they use a comparable and control price or CUP, transfer pricing method. So they have to find, uh, so compare between uh, one product and the equivalent, exactly equivalent of the product, same product. Uh, but the ECO in here, in our case, uh, use the resale price method. So I think uh, there is uh, some factor. Uh, so uh, between the taxpayer and tax authority is not uh, connecting or different different argument because uh, the transfer pricing method is also different between both. I think that's a uh, other uh, point of view. So j j just, just so that I can, you know, just confirm, perhaps there is a situation that Adam mentioned uh, that could be uh, possible that we have, the taxpayer has overcharged on the pricing of the products and undercharged on the royalties. And this could probably may be tax motivated uh, to avoid withholding taxes, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if you look at the aggregate picture, uh, even if you make the adjustments, I think uh, there could be downward adjustment and then upward adjustment. At the end of the day, there will be no change at least uh, at the end result. So I just wanted to provide input on two points. So I um, I know it was mentioned, but uh, you know the brief talks about uh, the standards of which you know the product is manufactured, and you know when we're talking about a pharmaceutical product, you know we're talking about something for consumption uh, by customers, and so I think there is something that goes along with you know making sure the quality of the product is what it should be. Uh, especially when you're talking about a multinational like XPT. And so by having, you know, a supply agreement with company B, they know that they're getting something to where, you know, that's essentially reducing the risk of, I think we've all seen recalls, you know, for a, a faulty product in the end and, um, you know, the potential lawsuit that can go along with that. Um, the other thing too is from the, the, the point of, um, you know, whether or not the 6% royalty is, 
you know, what it should be as far as, you know, the taxability of that income at the end of the day, it's an affiliate. Um, and you know, you're still going to have the inclusion of, of the affiliates income, you know, in the consolidation at that point. So the taxing authority is still going to be taxing, you know, the overall income most likely. What, what value is, is, is company a bringing to the table in a global value chain in this, in this group? It's a distributor at a local level of, in one country, a distributor at a local level. What, what is it doing? Why don't, why don't you inform me of why it deserves um, a significant return on what I consider a, a very limited role in this value added chain? I mean, let me just add maybe that 6% uh royalties on the value of the sales is not that unusual. It's a normal uh, amount of no remuneration. It's, it's typical. I mean, 6% is, a, is an acceptable amount. As regards the consolidation, considering that they are in two different countries, probably the amount is not going to be consolidated because you don't have typically cross-border consolidation for tax purposes. For tax purposes. <laughs> So, well, why can't I recharacterize my transaction if I'm the company and rewrite this as a distribution relationship, yeah. in which case I'm going to have a distrib distributor margin comparable to other distributor margins for other chemical products or pharma products. Um, what have you, and it's going to be in the range of, you know, somewhere less than 10%, I imagine, and um, versus, versus the challenge to company A, which is it's, it's paying way too high a price for this branded product in, in the region of what, $800, $850 per, per product, and thus that's going to increase its profit margin if that's denied, if it has to buy at the generic level, it's gonna increase its profit margin, whatever, we don't, we don't have that information, but let's just say way above what a normal distributor would be making, I assume. Um, on the other hand, the generics are buying, the generic distributors are buying from the generic company and, and we don't know from the facts what their profit margin is. But, uh, but generally speaking, in, in the real world, generic drug manufacturers, distributors aren't making, they don't have great profit margins. Their, 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 their business is to put out a lot of product, um, but they're not making much on any particular um, transaction, any particular product. So, um, Anyway, what, what, what is the value added that our, our company A is doing? Anyone have a comment? Okay. It builds relationships with doctors, that's for sure. Um, it, uh, it has logistics, it has to, it has to bring in the, the drugs and then, you know, get them to wherever they need to go. Um, it has uh, somebody at the customs because they have to get the drugs approved as they come across the border. Um, so those are some value added, but those are very typical distribution relationships, sales on the one side and relationships, um, point of entry, um, port of entry, um, responsibilities, logistics within country distribution center. Um, those are comparable to other uh, companies in, in uh, whether it be pharma or even automotive. Um, does company A deserve a higher margin than those type of distributor relationships? So they're, they're also manufacturing, right? They're buying from the manufacturer, isn't it? I thought they were just buying the ingredient and then manufacturing themselves. Yes, they do. Yes. Precisely. Oh, yeah, that's right. They're buying the ingredients. Sorry. Yeah, they're they're doing the mixing at the um at the at their level. Do you, um, so I mean, that, that's an additional. They're doing assembly. We would call that assembly, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, still, 
In the real but case, they don't they, own the assembly technology. They're paying that six percent royalty for it. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the re in the real case, they use the argument. They said something like, "Well, don't look to the generics. Look what we do in the other markets. Compare this was a case in uh, in the American continent, and they just said, look what happens in Europe. In Europe, it happens exactly like that." So we are not knowing anything different. It's just how the way it works. So they say you cannot even look to the, the, the generics. It's not, it's not comparable. If you want, look to other internal transactions, what happens with other members of the group, and then you will find that this is, this is common practice. Adding to that, I, I think possibly comparing the generics to the um, sort of regular medicine route is, is chalk and cheese because, like um, Professor Burns said, the the generics have a completely different profit model. They kind of focused on getting their product out as much as possible, as quickly as possible, whereas the the kind of brand name medicine is, is probably more focused on on clientele and doctor relations and and like building up a, a network for for prescription. Yeah, that's partially the argument they use. That's what in, uh, I'm stressing that's uh, argument B, that they say the way we produce, it's, it's, it's different. So we, you cannot compare it. It's a little bit what, uh, it's not exactly what Pramod say, but I think it was implied in his argument as well. One is the contractual relation. The other one is the way we produce, the quality of our product is better. You can sell two bottles of water, but probably in a, a Michelin star uh, restaurant, the, the quality is theoretically better. Both are water, but probably the per quality is better. Per yeah, perception. Will, yes, probably they will sell you Italian uh, water, like in the, in the other, they will sell tap water or whatever. They don't sell tap water, but just uh, <laughs> domestic based the brand. Yeah. Judge Barnes, you want to add something? Well, knowing something about pharma industry and supporting the American pharma companies, I think that there is not a comparable, uh, I don't think it's comparable to put generic to, uh, to the innovation and expense, as I perhaps explained when we were discussing pillar one, who bears the risk of that expense? And yes, as was brought up, the company did receive a tax benefit from its losses of the, many, of the many times that the trials didn't work out. On the other hand, who bore the cost of those losses? And that cost of the losses was borne by the United States FISC. And, uh, and so the United States as a country needs to receive back its value added um, for creating this innovative marketplace, if you will, which would be why the U.S. Treasury should be arguing on behalf of the pharmas, especially in the future going forward. Um, now we're gonna see in some pharma cases where the pharmas have taken their pharma IP and stuck in Ireland or what have you, but uh, um, which then from the U.S. Treasury point of view, it's, it's really gonna make them angry because here we've set up this marketplace where we bear all the costs of the losses and we have the in the Amazon case, the IRS calls it the uh, something of innovate, the culture of innovation, um, and blah, blah, blah. We have all that, and then, and, then, and then you strip it out to Ireland. So that's not right, right. But regardless, um, I think when you look at the life cycle of pharma and consider that no one product can be, or it'd be very rare that you could pull it out of their entire portfolio of product offerings. To say another way, I have to cost account a managerial accounting overhead in my supply chain for the entire corporate um, the entire corporate cycle from cradle to grave. And so my costs are going to be much, much higher. And this is reality. I mean, this is a trade, 
This is transfer pricing, but it has nothing to do with tax. This is just a reality that pharma faces. And uh, if they're going to remain um, as pharma leaders, and we're seeing this play out today, um, because as pharma is, as, as the risk that they are not allowed to have these super profits, if you will, from the successful, successful ones, investors or the money available at pharma is less. And that less is, is leading to, on their forecasting, less drugs coming out of their pipeline. And they're dealing with less problems. Now, maybe biotech, which I believe Michelin is investing in, um, is going to come and be very efficient and be able to fill in at a less R&D cost um, based on the backs of what other people have done, like the G Genome Project, but, but uh, produce some of the same outcomes without the big cost. I can put this in another way. Hollywood. Hollywood spends an incredible amount of wasteful money um, being Hollywood, throwing parties and just massive marketing and all that. But it does seem to work for Hollywood. That's their model. Bollywood, on the other hand, produces really good outcomes also um, without the same type of expenditures. They still make a good bit of money, though. Um, Hollywood would never allow itself to be compared to Bollywood because if it was, it would have to knock out half of its entertainment expense. On the, on the other hand, Bollywood will compare itself to Hollywood and say, um, and say our movies are comparable in quality and so forth. Hollywood has to distinguish itself somehow being that it does spend $120 million or now $180 million a flick. Um, that's pretty hard to, uh, to justify uh, unless you have, uh, well, unless you're Hollywood. Okay, so those are my those are my looking at what is comparable and not comparable. The answer is there is no answer. It's a gray argu argument, <laughs> and both sides or all sides, especially when you have multilateral multilateral sides, all sides are going to have a different perspective on where what's comparable and in terms of what. Is it the whole industry? Is it a segment of the industry? Is it parts of the supply chain in the segment of the industry? Perhaps other parts not. And this is just great. And this is, this is where transfer pricing get paid the big bucks um, to argue it out and, uh, and say this is more comparable or less comparable. I think that functions within the supply chain are comparable. Distributorship relationships, and it doesn't even have to be pharma to pharma. It could be pharma to tech, pharma to da. Distributor relationships um, have, have comparable functions for what they do. And where they're less comparable, those can be comparable to something else. Um, but the, the innovation, the R&D, that's comparable but comparable only to companies in that same expenditure space. So Hollywood to Hollywood, Bollywood to Bollywood, but you can't take Bollywood versus Hollywood. We can't take Eli Lilly and compare it to that Israeli company um, that makes uh, the generics. Um, the Israeli company has a, I think they're the market leader. The Israeli and the Indian company are the market leaders in generics. And what they do, they do really well. Um, and they're really successful at it but it's a high volume market. And that high volume market doesn't require a whole lot of R&D relative to Eli Lilly um, or Pfizer. Uh, so again, the answer is there's no answer. You have to argue it out and, 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 and put forward your best case of what's comparable or not. There is no answer to what is comparable. Um, there's just arguments or perspectives. Uh, okay, that's my opinion, and I think the European opinion changes, depends on whether it's an American company involved or a German or French company involved. If it's an American company involved, the Europeans say, no, they're all the same. <laughs> India, Israel, Eli Lilly, it's all the same. 
But if we take a German pharma company, all of a sudden, magically, it's a little bit different. And, and they get like, oh, no, no, there, there's R&D and innovation going on here. Anyway, that's just my perception of how cases play out. I'm, that argument doesn't work against me. I wrote in my PhD that there's no certain comparable, either in the US or anywhere else in the world. So I agree with you this time. There's no discussion, American discussion versus Europe. That, that, that's, that's fine with me. So I, I just well, want to- another one on the cup. And this actually is in the historical cases when they're trying to figure out what arm's length means. And when I say historical, I mean between the 40s and the 60s. Must you use transactions between two third parties or can you use internal transactions with third parties? Or even in one case, can they use internal transactions um, only, but in other, with other countries? Yeah. So that, those are you know, three ways of looking at cup. That's actually that what was used uh, in this case, because they argued we should use purely internal transactions, so between different uh, companies in the group, against the uh, using an independent party in which you would buy to a company that produces the, the generic uh, the generic product. What's interesting also is that a very simple case as this one, we already two hours of discussion. I think nobody agrees if it's comparable or not. Well, you've you've you brought me to my wonderful quote for the week then. Um, so I'm looking at the Lufkin Foundry and Machinery Company case of 1972. And the battle was over the comparable. And Lufkin, the company said, uh, we, we're, we, we have to look internally at our transactions, but with many other countries. The commissioner, the IRS argues that you have to produce probative evidence of prices charged between two unrelated parties. That's the only evidence that counts. Otherwise, the IRS is allowed to reset the prices however they want under 42. That was the IRS's argument. The court says, the judge says in Lufkin, and I just love the first part of the sentence, although, and he's referring to the 1968 transfer pricing regs, which were not so complicated relative to what we have later on. He writes, although these subsections are too prolix to warrant explication in this opinion, and then he, a careful reading of them demonstrates the evidence of transactions of uncontrolled companies unrelated to the taxpayer must necessarily be presented. The second half of the sentence I don't care about, the first half is the interesting part. Too prolix to warrant explication in this opinion. The judge says, I'm not gonna read those regs. They're just too long and complicated. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what makes common sense because I'm the judge. That's how I understand the judge in Lufkin. But regardless, the word prolix, I never heard that word in English until I'd read the Lufkin case. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> And nobody goes around saying the word explication anymore. So um, anyway, I encourage you to look at the Lufkin case as an example. Yeah, I mean, this case that uh, we dealt with this week, Suzanne, sorry, I couldn't reply to your email when you asked me to, but it was based exactly on the GlaxoSmithKline case that took almost 20 years to get a final decision. So it started in the tax court of Canada, went to the federal court of appeal and reached to the Supreme Court uh, and deals precisely with issues that we that you discussed during today's class, including also this issue that William raised now in terms of the comparables, because the discussion was the application of the top methods in which they raised, no, you should look to what we do in other markets, look to the GlaxoSmith decline in Europe and how they price the transactions. And uh, yeah, Brown in Canada was arguing in favor of, of looking to independent parties. Uh, so the tax court of Canada was in favor of the Crown, so in favor of the tax authorities, saying that, yeah, you can look, you can unbundle the contracts, you can look to the transactions independently, 
The Federal Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court said no. Well, when you deal with economic circumstances, the economic circumstances of a bundle contract are different. You cannot take the generic as uh, a comparable. So a lot of dispute, 20 years. And just to prove to Pramod that uh, not 15 minutes is 15 years. Uh, I think I'm going to send it. I will put it on the on the G drive. The, on the different level. Of the I think it's actually a relatively straightforward case. So then you can you can read it if you want to in terms of the what are the arguments that would work. Um, it's all right. Can I say something? Sure. Yep. So in trying to locate the case, I plug in the um, omniprosoly and um, some other parameters. So I came up to US case. Um, so they have two transfer pricing cases um, with the IRS in the States. One of them, um, the company actually paid the um, taxes assessed and appealed and is trying to get it back from the um, IRS. Um, that's still in works, but th that company has been sued a lot of time. Um, so it's not only Canada, it's in the States also, but I didn't um, really follow up to detail on which stage that case in is at, but it's, it, that, I'm just mentioning it for, um, Comparison sake. I think on, on Monday, being tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., you can ask also Lorraine Eden about Glaxo because she was in Canada at the time advising the Revenue Department um, on that case. So, uh, uh, because she was, uh, well, she's Canadian. <laughs> and. Uh, and then she married the uh, dean of, uh, or the future dean of the Bush School and, and moved down to Texas A&M. So um, not to be out Texas A&M though, I did go and grab my uh, jersey. So um, to you, Daniela. <laughs> but the, um, I don't know where my hats are though. I, I've moved my office downstairs and moved all the closet around. So <laughs> I temporarily misplaced them. Next, on Monday, tomorrow, I will be wearing my hat. Okay, um, we've come to the, to the top of two hours, and um, and I know that our uh, JD students uh, will feel hard okay, pressed. Oh, go uh, on, Susan. Yes, uh, uh, I have uh, the Supreme Court document. Uh, may I uh, upload to the G drive? That's good. Yes, yeah. Good. Uh, and uh, second one uh, for uh, link for the week number two, the second week. Uh, are have, have already sent yet? Link for the second week. Link for the second week, yeah? Yes, uh, uh, have already sent yet because I, I only can uh, see the first week link for the G drive. Okay, you cannot see the uh, second week. Okay, yes. it's, it's all in there. So I will, uh, let me re-add your name to the uh, big G drive. And I, I just sent out the link for the G drive, not add your name. And you, and you should be able to see all weeks in it. I'm gonna add it to the chat right now, one moment. Yes, thank you. And Suzanne, you need to ask for a salary raise to get a new microphone. I mean, <laughs> what do we need to do to get a new microphone? We need to one. ask everyone to give five dollars for that. <laughs> this is a new one. This is a new one, and I think I think the internet connection. I think <laughs> because of we the need internet to, connection. Come on! I mean, they're selling a lot of tobacco. A lot of people smoke in Asia, so asking for a microphone. Yes, this is the new one. The new one. No, no, you need so, to get one of those, uh, like Dan has. They're, those are good. Those are better. That's it, like a headset. Yeah, or Nathan also has one of those. Yes. 
<laughs> or you get the real microphone. I can show you mine. I can send you the really I professional. Think, I think because I think the internet connection because it's uh, up and down sometimes, frequently I think. Okay. But you're not at work because at work you can also ask for a better connection. I mean, yes. Uh, just complain, you know. They're, 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 it's American Tobacco Company. You can complain and they will do it for you. Yeah, uh, okay. So I added the link into the chat right now for the G Drive, and you should see every week um, listed there. And under the G Drive for week two, um, Lorraine uploaded under case studies the Christmas tree case study her comments about the Christmas tree case study and searching for a cup um, about how to think about the comparable for that. Then under materials, she uploaded read me first, like her lecture on cup, um, then her notes about economics and cup, and she outed, uploaded the guidelines, ignore that, the guidelines in the United Nations I already told you, to, you know, just read the cup chapter. And then she uploaded another document, actually I'm gonna move it to case studies, a, a group of case studies document by Ainsworth. So I'm gonna move that one to um, under her case studies folder. Yeah, okay, I just did that. And, um, and then you have my uh, treatise uh, chapters. Then she has another uh, a PDF, um, a PowerPoint uh, on TP basics about her case study and, uh, and how um, multinational groups um, work from a managerial science uh, problem. And then the last thing she has is statistical methods, looking at CUP from a big data perspective. Um, so lots of good um, economic articles that she's pulled out. If you didn't know, Lorraine's a top economist in the world. She has over 15,000 citations to her articles. That's like an insane number, an insane number in academics. And um, okay, so they're all there. You should see them in course one, week two now in your G drive. I have also, while we were talking, I backed up everything to the eCampus. It's already there, including her video lecture. So um, you'll, you'll see it all there. So the classes uh, timings have changed. Is it going to be each Mondays and uh, Fridays or something like that? No, Mondays and Wednesdays. Lorraine is available Monday and uh, well, Wednesdays. Um, when I don't care. I mean, either way, I hate eight o'clock. I don't care what day I hate it. It uh, can't be Sundays because Mark Ray, because he has to drive to the office. That's why he's not there here. Um, so it has to be not Sundays. I think not Fridays because of the Middle East. Yes, yes, that's right. So she's not here, but on uh, um, Joella um, uh, can't do Fridays. Nabil, you can't do Fridays either, right? Fridays are bad, isn't it? It is, it is. It it's, yeah, yeah, Fridays uh, are bad. Actually, not me, my wife, basically. Friday She's night. shopping on Fridays, so Nabil has I'm, to go with <laughs> I try to avoid her, that by having the class Sunday, Monday instead. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, I mean, but, if we want to have different class times, George Salas is, uh, is going to take week three, four, and five and talk about big data, econometrics, blah, 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 all that stuff I mentioned previously on, uh, on uh, Wednesday. But um, but we can have the discussion when George between Monday and Wednesday Monday. to prepare a case study. I mean, hmm? I'm defending the students now. That's mm -hmm. right. It's a short time, time, but I, I when else are we gonna have it? I mean, it's back of to course. Sunday. No, I'm just, I, I was just Saturday. wondering. I mean, it, it's a if bit Yannick, tight. I would say. If Yannick accept one day gap between them, I'm fine with that. It's, it depends on on Yannick. But it's just me. Sunday is so good. I don't know. Yeah. Nabil, Nabil, I had no choice. I had to go shopping with my wife just now. Oh. I, I had no choice. So throughout this, was just shopping. So. It's a shopping list, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't say no. I was told to go. 
Good man, good man. Well done. Well, I think I can turn the recording off at this point. <laughs> but, Prof, what is the downside of Sunday morning? It's such a nice um, time to, to have a well, class. Yeah, for sure. Like, Lorraine won't do, isn't available on Sundays, won't do Sundays. But uh, oh, okay. Mark Ray in, in, in Beijing, China blocks Zoom. So the only way for him to use it is to drive an hour and a half to his office at 10 o'clock for 10 o'clock at night, use the VPN at the office to access Zoom. So That's not good. Want, no, if we want Mark Ray to... Uh, if we want Mark Ray um, to... Uh,